Hello everyone, it is time for our weekly live stream. Uh, that being said, next weekend is a holiday weekend, there will not be a live stream next Saturday. So typically we do a stream every Saturday. <laughs> I know, it sounds contradictive, right? And we talk about the aquarium, we usually have a topic that we discuss for 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. And then after that it's a Q&A section that allows the audience that's live during the live stream to ask questions and answer them directly. We've been doing this for years, but if you're new to the channel, this uh, you might not know this process. You may be looking for a little short video. I do short videos on this channel as well. The Reef Diaries is a great example. There's 130 episodes you can binge. And um, then there's some medium-sized videos in there that are between 10 minutes and I'd say 30 minutes probably. But the live streams are where it's at. That's where we talk about a lot of stuff. And I drop these little tidbits in there that help you so much with what uh, you would love to know as a hobbyist. I've got a head full of knowledge. I've been in the hobby since 1997. And because of that, I've lived and seen a lot. <laughs> I've gone through a lot of mistakes. I've had a lot of things happen to my tanks over the years. But uh, behind me is a 400 gallon reef. I'm actually talking to you guys like you're all brand new, but I know that everyone here in the room has pretty much been here for a long time. So I'm done recapping. I just want to say hello to all of you. And I thought today we could talk about proper feeding methods because I, I read people's posts online and I see things that, um, yeah, let's just say they concern me a little bit. I mean, ultimately you are going to decide what is best for your aquarium, but sometimes you don't know what's best for your aquarium and you're thinking this is a good solution. And I don't know that I agree. So I wanted to kind of touch on that today and we'll go into what are some of the things that I've been doing? What are some of the, you know, there's a lot of choices when it comes to feeding. And the one thing that concerns me the most is when people stop feeding because they're so worried about nutrients in the water. And nutrients are part of life. If you didn't get nutrients in your body, you would not be watching this live stream. <laughs> you would be in a deathbed. We all need things and everything behind me has a mouth. Everything is hungry from the tiniest little coral polyp all the way to the big fish. And we need to continually give them something to eat and when people say, I feed my tank every other day, I'm just, I can't believe it. How often do you eat each day? How many times do you put something in your mouth? Now think about these corals that are waiting for that to happen. And it's either going to be the feeding you offer, or it's going to be fish poop, or it's going to be a speck of something that blew through the system. But uh, that's it till the next time. Where in the ocean, food is constantly present. There's always something happening. There's always an opportunity. And we want to make sure that we are providing adequate food to our aquariums and not starving the livestock because we're worried about phosphates or we're worried about nitrate. Those other things that I just discussed, I mean, those, you know, nitrate and phosphate, you can tackle that in other ways besides taking away the food that the livestock relies on to stay alive. So we can start off with the simplest of things. Normally when people are setting up an aquarium, the first thing they do is they probably buy some flake food and they get that jar and then they put in so much and they don't know how much to put. They just guess. So the general rule of thumb with any kind of feeding you do is normally what you put in the tank should be gone within two minutes. So if you have food blowing around five minutes, 10 minutes later, it was too much food. Now I'm talking about solid foods, not broadcast feeding, which we'll get into a little bit later. So if you put in flake food and it looks like uh, New Year's Eve <laughs> with a big celebration, all the confetti coming down, and it just doesn't seem to stop you've completely overfed your tank and it was too much because their stomachs can only hold so much and then the rest is waste. Now that can lead to problems in the tank with nitrate and phosphate rising because the excess food is just rotting. So you wanna put in enough food so everyone can get a meal. Another choice that people like to use would be pellet food. And these are both dry foods. Flake food and pellet food are staples. They've been in the hobby forever. They've always been an option for us. And probably a lot of people tend to use that more than you think. But um, these foods can provide some of the nutrients that these fish and corals need, but it's not everything. And so I like to mix it up with other things. But if you are, um, if you're wanting to use an auto feeder, typically you're gonna put in something like pellet food or very fine flake food that can drizzle into the system and add some food to the tank once or twice a day. And that's the other thing that I want to, ah, I've got so much to say. <laughs> um, you don't have to feed a lot of food, but you could feed a tiny bit frequently. So if you enjoy feeding your fish, if you like to hand feed your fish and you're holding in some food in there and a few little pellets or a little bit of flake is you know, chewed by their mouths right out of your fingertips, that's adorable and it's fun. You know, nothing wrong with that. And if you do that, just do a little bit 
And then in a few hours later, you can do it again, and you can do it again, and you can just keep enjoying yourself. And many years ago, I was visiting, I mean, I visited the 20,000 gallon reef on Long Island several times, but I think it was the first time I visited, uh, I got to go behind the scenes and go on top of the tank where there's a gantry. It's literally a bridge that goes right over the middle of the reef. Now this is a huge tank. Uh, like I said, 20,000 gallons. I think I remember the dimensions being like 35 feet long and 14 feet front to back and about eight, 12 feet tall. And so there's this, this walkway, this, this hollow plank. It's actually um, called, oh man, I think RFG, it might be the wrong initials, but it basically looks like uh, a million squares and it's a very durable plastic that won't, you know, it can't do anything. It's super strong. It definitely hold up a human or two. And I went out on this gantry and I sat down just to enjoy the reef from above. And Joe, the curator, he said, oh, you want to, you know, get a good look? Let me do this. And so first he stopped a little bit of flow, but not all of it. And then he took an entire package of P.E. Mysis. Now, P.E. Mysis is a frozen food that we'll be getting into shortly, but it has, it's very, uh, it's a very rich food. A little bit goes a long way <clears throat> and it's very oily. So when Joe would take this package and when I say package, I mean, literally the whole package, you tear it open and then you would throw all of that frozen brick into the tank at one time, <laughs> the whole thing. And when he did it, the surface of the water looked like glass and you could look down and look at the reef and see the beautiful corals and it was fantastic. Now he did that specifically to give me the view and he was not worried about polluting his tank, especially with the size of the tank and the amount of fish he had in there that eat several times a day, but it was fantastic. But what I noticed in front of me against the wall, which would be the wall dividing the aquarium from the general public, there was this wall going straight up, all the lights are hanging above and behind me. I'm, si I'm sitting on this gantry and I see these buckets of pellet food and I got super excited and I said to Joe, can I feed your fish? And he was, uh, he looked at me kind of side eye and he was like, yeah, go ahead, you can feed them. So I grabbed this bucket and it was omnivore, uh, omnivore food, which means it works for all fish. And I took a few pellets, literally like two or three, and just went doink and threw them in like you're feeding koi at the pond, right? And I would just do this. I do that and then a couple of tangs would come up and gobble it up and then I'd do it again. And I'm just throwing one or two pellets at a time. And he says, what are you doing? You can feed them more than that. And I said, yeah, but I can do this all day long. <laughs> and he didn't argue with me. It was, it was fun. And so I kept throwing food over and then some to the copper band and some to these tangs and some to these, you know, there was all these different fish in this tank and a lot of them were swirling around the top like piranhas and they were excited to get extra food besides their normal fare. Now, I, um, I could have put in more. I could have just done it and, been, and had it rain down in the tank and that would have been my, my chance to have a handful of food and throw it in a tank. But no, I enjoyed the actual little bit. So if you want to feed your tank several times a day, you totally can. Just a little tiny bit at a time will not hurt your system. It will not ruin your water parameters. And your fish will actually have food in their stomach much longer than if you only feed once a day. And if you only feed every other day, I hate that. I, I really don't like that you're doing that. I'm going to encourage you not to do that. But like I said, ultimately, you're going to decide what's best for your system and what works well for you. But for me, I, I just don't like the idea of an empty stomach. And I don't like seeing thin fish. I feel that fish that are thicker tend to be a little bit more um, robust and can handle more, um, they can tolerate more and they tend to not get sick because they are, you know, hefty. They have an immune system that's, you know, pretty well fed. So, and I know I'm kind of using a pun there, but anyway, we wanna keep enough food in our fish that they're healthy and strong so that they uh, can handle things when water parameters go off and alkalinity drops or temperature gets too hot or you know some other weird thing happens and normally where a fish might break out in something because their immune system is down, it's weakened because they're already not getting enough food on a regular basis. So I am encouraging you to feed a little bit more, maybe more frequently, less amounts. And the other part of the equation is how much is the right amount? Now I mentioned the two minute rule, so you're gonna have to play with that but when I had a 29 gallon aquarium, which maybe some of you have smaller tanks, maybe you have a 10 gallon or a 20 or a 40 gallon and you're not sure how much to put in and you have two clownfish and a coral beauty and a royal grama and a six line wrasse and you might think, well, I don't know how much to feed these five little fish. Well, 
uh, if you were to buy frozen food from your fish store, you're going to get these little <clears throat> cubes. Or you might get a flat sheet. But most people like to buy the cubes because they can pop one out and they can put it in the tank or they can melt it first and put it in the tank. And I just want to point out that you can actually cut the cube in half. And you can just set it down on a cutting board, take a sharp knife, cut that cube in half, and now you might have the right dose or the right food size for that one feeding session. And you have the other half of the cube for the next time you want to feed. So you don't have to use a whole cube if that's the smallest amount you have. If you're using flake food or pellet food, like I mentioned before, you can use a pinch. And uh, you can look and you can see, and if they still seem hungry and you want to put in another pinch, you can kind of gauge and see how much is the right amount for your aquarium. It's not that much of a mystery. It's just a matter of figuring it out. And you know, you can think about if you have any other pets or children or other adults in your home, you can look at what they do when they eat. How much food do you put on their plate? Do you ever make a mountain? Or do you just put a few things on there? Do they want seconds? So can you fill the plate a little bit more to avoid the seconds? Same with our dogs or cats. How much food goes in their bowl? Is there food left over? Or was there not enough and they're still hungry? It's the same principle with our fish. So we want to do that. And I've only mentioned the fish because that's what we watch eat. But there's other things in our tank that eat as well. A lot of corals have polyps that open up and want to capture food. There's anemones, there's feather dusters, there's cucumbers, starfish. I mean, there's a, quite the list of things that we put in our aquariums and they all have a mouth and they all want to be fed. So we want to make sure that we are not leaving anything out. Now, before I move on to the next section, I do want to emphasize with flake food, you have different types of flake food. And I'm talking about saltwater flake food. So I wouldn't use freshwater fish food in a saltwater tank. So just don't even do that. Just find something that's made for saltwater. Petco, PetSmart, Amazon, your local fish store, they will all have what you need for your saltwater aquarium. Now, you can get the omnivore version of the fish food. You can get the, um, why is it, can I, I not think of words when I'm on camera? Uh, the vegetarian version is what I'm trying to say, or the uh, the green version, the uh, vegetation, the algaes. There's kind of foods that are, there are foods out there that are made in the green family. It's specifically for fish that eat, that are herbivores. That's it. See, I knew I'd think of the word. <laughs> and they need more plant life in their diet. And then there's some fish that need more sponge in their diet, like angels. They need to eat sponge. And so you would have to have a food that has sponge in it, but that's something else. So we want to look at the different types of flake food. You want to see what they're enriched with. You want to see if maybe they've got probiotics added to it. And I know that cobalt, for example, has several different types of flake food, including some with probiotics. And probiotics is a a word that gets thrown around a lot, and people are oftentimes trying to figure out, uh, you know, well, they just think it must be good because it's probiotics, and so they buy it. And I remember there was one fish vendor out there, or fish food vendor out there, that was saying it can only be inside frozen food, and anyone that tells you it's in flake food or, or in dry food is a liar. And of course, that raised uh, hackles with the dry food company who said, we absolutely have probiotics in our dry food, and we can prove it, and we've got the papers to support that information, and you had to retract. So probiotics are a good thing. They're beneficial for the gut of the fish, and uh, if you have the option to buy food with that in it, you shouldn't resist the urge or fear that it's a bad thing. It absolutely can be done. Um, so that's your choice. And then the other thing, like when we talked about pellet food, it comes in different sizes. I remember the first time I went to buy pellet food at the fish store down the street from me called um, Fish Paradise. They sold me a jar. I came home and I opened up, you know, the lid and there's a foil and I rip off the foil and there's these huge nuggets, ginormous nuggets. And I'm looking at my clownfish and I'm like, there's no way they can eat this ball bearing. It's just much too large. And so I went back to the store and said, hey, I got the wrong one. And he said, we can't take that back. I said, yeah, you can. And he says, no, I can't. <laughs> I said, I know you can. I didn't buy it on purpose. I didn't use it. I opened the lid and discovered the problem immediately. I didn't know there was different sizes of pellet food. And I said, in worst case, you can feed it to your fish here in the store. So he, he caved in and he says, okay, I'll take it back. And he let me get the other one. He didn't charge me for a second jar, which seems logical because he doesn't want me to come back and do business with him. But sometimes you just run into individuals that just want to say no immediately. So anyway, the pellet food was too large, and so you need to look at the front of the jar and see if it says small pellet, 
medium, large, or maybe it will be grain size and it might say two millimeters, three millimeters you know, or larger. And that way you're aware of it. Uh, the, the pellet food from Reef Nutrition, the TDO brand or TDO style of food that they offer comes in lots of different sizes. And so you want to really look at that and find out what's right for your reef tank. What are you trying to feed specifically? If you're trying to feed tangs, you don't want the tiniest pellet ever. But if you're trying to feed a lot of baby little fish, you know, little tiny gobies and such, then you would definitely want smaller pellets. And there's also fast sinking and there's slow sinking pellets. So you take the pellet and you drop it, and shoo, goes to the bottom, that's fast sinking. If it kind of drizzles down and the flow moves it across, that's slow sinking. And the benefit of pellet food that falls a little slower is fish can catch it in the water column, where if it sinks rapidly to the bottom, it's gonna be sitting on the sand and some fish may not even go down to pick it off the sand, they may not want to. So you wanna make sure that you're getting the right kind of pellet food that's good for your livestock. And you can use pellet food for more than just fish. So I know that there are people out there that will feed LPS corals, they may feed zoanthids, uh, they may feed recordia, uh, I'm trying to think of other things. Uh, so these are the foods, these are corals that eat more slowly, but they may drizzle down these little tiny bits of pellet food on top of those corals with a flow off in the tank so that the coral can migrate the food to the center, to their mouth, and inhale it in. So you uh, have a lot of options just in dry foods when it comes to pellet and flake. I've talked for, what, 10 minutes already about this, and I didn't run out of information. <laughs> so let's talk about another food that you can use. Some people would prefer just to use frozen. I, I like to use frozen. I use it every single night. But I do throw in other things in my tank from time to time as well to keep it diverse. And that's the other thing. There's nothing wrong with having multiple types of foods so you can alternate. Just like we alternate different food on our plates every day. We don't just eat oatmeal every single day for the rest of our lives. You know, we have cereal, we have oatmeal, we have a donut, we have a bagel, we have a banana. You know, we switch it up. And in your aquarium, you can do the same thing. You can use the omnivore one day, the herbivore the next day. You could use frozen the third day. Um, I mean, you can just kind of keep changing it up. And if you are wanting to use frozen foods, there's so many choices. You may not know which kinds to get. Um, I'm myself, I, I really like to use Rod's food and there's probably five or six different types that he offers. And if your fish store doesn't carry them all, but you see it on his website, you can ask your fish store to bring in that specific one. Like for example, when I talked with Rod recently, he sent me a box full of uh, fish food for my reef as a uh, eight year anniversary or eight year birthday of my tank, which was really great. And I've got a freezer full of packets now, which is really, <laughs> really nice. I've been buying it probably one or two packets a month now for some time. And so to get some for free was a really cool thing. And he specifically mentioned Predator Blend. I was like, no, I do not want that. Last time you gave that to me as a nice reward, I gave it to someone that had predators because predator fish like puffers and lionfish and groupers, uh, these are the ones that are gonna gobble up big food. They, they chew it up, it's messy. Uh, the chunks are really big. And if you are not running a predator tank, which most of you probably are not, you're going to want different fare, different size foods, different flavors inside the mixture. So I like to have different ones from Rod. I like the original blend. And then he has the Pacific Plankton. And he has uh, his Krill, which is a nice soft one. It's not hard to break. So you can, it's just kind of soft. It's interesting that it does that. It comes out of a freezer. Everything's frozen in my freezer, including my ice cubes. And this stuff's bendy. It, I can just break a little piece off, tear it up, melt it in some water. So those are three that come to mind. I know he's got more. Plus he has uh, other dry foods like nori. So that is another kind of food that you can put in your tank. Uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Nori is sheet algae. And usually when I put it in my tank, I put it on a clip, like this feeding clip right here I use from Two Little Fishies. And I'll take a sheet that's about this big. No, it's about this big and about that tall. I tear the sheet in half. I fold it up and I put it in here and make that clip. You know, I put the clip where I like it and then the fish come eat off of it. And once the uh, nori has gone, it's gone. If there was nori still there 30 minutes later because your fish didn't consume it all, I would use less next time. You might even take the clip out of the water and set it on the top of the tank. And then when you're ready to put it back in the tank again, lower it down in the water. Don't just leave it there forever. Like it's this indefinite, uh, it's not a salt lick. <laughs> it's not there just where the fish can work on it forever. It will just break down and add problems to your tank and grow algae. 
So we want to, you know, the algae will grow because of this, this nutrient in your system. So use the right amount of nori where, again, it gets consumed in a matter of minutes. Uh, when I went to visit my friend Tammy, her 800-gallon reef or whatever, that, yeah, 800 I think is right, was filled with huge tangs. And she would take PVC pipe and she'd wrap nori on one piece. She'd wrap nori on the other part of the pipe, rubber band it into place. And then she got a second pipe and she did another sheet and another sheet. And then she affixed these pipes of nori into the tank with cleaning magnets or something, or some apparatus. I can't even remember how she did it. And then the tanks went crazy and were ripping at it and tearing it all off the pipe. And that's how they consumed it. And she could lower it down into the halfway down into the tank with magnets against the glass. And the fish could consume the nori under the surface of the water and not be exposed to the surface, not be gobbling a bunch of air in their, their mouths when they're trying to eat which, of course, fish don't need to do. It's not really beneficial to them. I do sell nori from my website. I sell the bulk pack. I think it's... Uh, I think it's 100 sheets are in there. And so I'm using half a sheet a day, which means I get about six months worth out of, you know, for my tank, maybe a little bit longer, if I were to use it every single day. And I don't. I tend to use it a few times a week and because I'm feeding every single night with frozen food. So I'm not feeling the need to put in nori every single day. So you see, that's where we're, we're choosing when to use certain things in the aquarium. Now, other frozen foods that are out there, there is Larry's food, Larry's uh, Reef Frenzy. Um, there's Hikari. They've been around forever with lots of different sized foods. There's one called Pro Salt, which is the one I usually get the bucket of krill where I, they're flash frozen and I will take those krill and I actually tear them up and then throw them in the tank. That way the, the bigger fish can consume it like Spock. And the smaller fish, like the skunk clown fish, will take the krill to the anemone to save it for later, but the anemone just eats it. <laughs> so it, it works out that way. And then if I have any kind of uh, ornamental shrimp, like blood shrimp, cleaner shrimp, peppermint shrimp, they may grab some krill, which sounds a little bit like a cannibal, but it is what it is. And this food um, is really good for your tank as well. So there are a few choices. I'm sure there's many more that exist that I'm not even aware of. I just saw uh, an Instagram post about something. It's been around now for a couple of years, and I totally forgot about it. And I think it was called Eco or Epo. And it was a type of food in a foil pouch. And somehow they hooked it up with a doser and they were trickling that in. And I would like to look into that one because I forgot about it. And I'd like to see more about it because some people were talking about it. Like I said, about a year ago, two years ago, it was something people were like, I need to get this food. And I guess it's more popular overseas maybe. And it was just coming to the U.S. at that time. In the meantime, it's been off my radar. I've been busy with other things. But uh, so there is, you know, another example of a different choice. And then... Besides frozen food and dry sheet algae and pellet food and flake food, there are different foods that are paste. I remember uh, Instant Ocean came out with these little packets. You could tear open this paste out of the foil packet, like a mustard packet, and squeeze it in, and it kind of fell in sort of like a pink worm into the water. And once the, the flow hit, it just dispersed. It just went everywhere. Or the fish ripped it to shreds and it came out their gills, and then the other little fish came and ate what they could get from it. And so I used that for a while because why not? I, I got it and I wanted to try it out. There's also food that looks like a tablet or a pellet that you can stick on the glass called mastic. And that is another one that is designed for slow feeding where you could put this thing on the front of your glass inside the aquarium and it would stick to the glass, I guess, <clears throat> not sure how, but the other fish would then come gnaw on it and eat on it. And that was a, a method. And then remember I mentioned the salt lick before? There was a feeding wheel that it looked like a small, flat, uh, chunky donut. And you put a post through the middle of the donut with a suction cup and you stuck it on the glass. And the fish could gnaw on that hardened donut and work their way through it. And that, I don't remember that lasting very long. Maybe it still exists, but um, everyone got interested and then it just kind of faded away like viral. <laughs> it wasn't a forever thing. Now, when it comes to making your own fish food, which is another option, if, if everything I've described sounds like too much work and you'd much rather spend time in your kitchen preparing a meal for your fish, you can. And you can get all kinds of, of fresh seafood from the local deli at your supermarket, 
or you could mix fresh with frozen seafood, which is another technique, or you can take all your frozen foods you've been buying and you can combine them into a blender and turn them into a new mush that's a little bit of everything. And then when you pour that in your tank, it's like Skittles for the reef. Every single fish that likes a certain thing will get what it likes mixed into that uh, plethora of choices that you dropped in because you made it into one batch. But specifically, the foods we would want to use if we're going to make our own food with uh, seafood would be squid, krill, scallops, shrimp, clams, octopus. These are things that you can obtain. And then you can flash freeze them. You know, you put them in your freezer for a short time to kind of harden them up. And then you can put them on a cutting board and you can dice them down pretty small. And then you can put them in a food processor. And the longer you run the processor, the more fine the food will become. So if you want a coarse food with larger pieces, you would run the blender uh, or a food processor for you know 30 seconds or so. And then if you say, oh, this stuff's way too big, then you could do another 30 seconds and you could take a look and then you say, ah, I want to go a little bit longer. You can go another 30 seconds and now it's very fine. Or you could have some coarse pieces, set that aside, blend up some more and make finer and finer food and then you could literally combine the coarse with the fine foods and create, again, the daily food you're going to put in your tank in different sizes all inside the same piece of uh, frozen fare that you're going to be offering. Once you've blended it all up, the simplest approach most people have taken is they would put the mush or the paste inside a Ziploc bag and they lay it flat in the freezer. And then they can break off pieces as they want to cons you know, use it out to be consumed in the tank. But uh, some people have done things with ice cube trays, and they'll find little specialty trays made of um, silicone that are little circles, and they will use a, a spatula to trowel it in to really fill them all in, get them frozen hard, and then they can pop them all out either one at a time or loosen them all into a bag. So you have a bag of nuggets, and then you can reach in the bag and take out what you need. I'm trying to see. If... I'm going to go close the door. One second. Hey, you. All right, Jack was barking at the mailman. That's her job. <laughs> the one thing you don't want to use when it comes to preparing your own frozen food would be pre-cooked seafood. We don't want to do that. You want your seafood to be fresh or fresh frozen, which I call flash frozen. And that way, any kind of parasites are eliminated because it was frozen rapidly. But if it was cooked, it has changed the nutrients in the system of, you know, in, the nutrients in the fodder. And we don't want to do that. You know, so avoid that. We don't want to use cooked foods at all. I also never, ever use, I used to buy these frozen packs of like mixed seafood. And inside they love to put in, for filler, I guess, real imitation uh, crab meat. <laughs> and I don't want any imitation anything in my reef. So I would always throw that away. I, there was no way I was going to use that. But I used the squid, and I used the octopus, I used the clam, I used the scallops. I used the shrimp. All that was put in. The artificial stuff was tossed aside, not to be used. Uh, you can also use mussels. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the different things that, um, that have worked over the years that are, are nice choices. And this type of meal that you prepare, you can be pretty, I mean, it's, it depends where you're shopping. Like we have a store here called Central Market and it's very expensive there. And you buy seafood there, it's gonna cost you a lot. But probably if you bought seafood in a regular supermarket, it might cost less. And to make your own should save you money. And then you can add other things to the frozen food. You can actually mix in some pellet food, some flake food, some spirulina powder. Um, you could even include some garlic oil or um, I'm trying to think what else people, uh, there was another thing. I never bought it. I always heard of it. What did they use? I can't think of it. But it was, I can see the bottle in my head, but I can't see the label. <laughs> but they added these things in during the mixing process. And that way they had this really uh, well mixed batch of food that had, Huff of fatty acids, vitamins, 
of course, all the nutrients from the seafood itself. And uh, they knew all the ingredients they put into it. And there was no surprise. There was no gel binders or anything that they were concerned about. So these are things you can do if you want to. And there's nothing wrong with that. And then once you've got it all frozen in the freezer, then you can just take out what you need as you need it, which is nice. Now, terrestrial plants that sometimes people use would be broccoli, romaine lettuce, butter lettuce, orange slices, and I've seen crazy things happen around holidays like pumpkins for Halloween. <laughs> I've seen that done. Uh, no, most no one does that, but public aquariums like to do it. And so if you want to use broccoli in your tank, like to feed your tangs, you need to take the broccoli itself, and I would cut off all the heads uh, to have, you know, well, I would cut it into a size that's workable for your tank. We're not going to take an entire uh, broccoli florette and stick that in there like some kind of a wedding bouquet. It's got to be something smaller. But you want to put it in boiling water for 15 seconds. And that's just blanching it really quickly. And now anything that's on it, including any kind of pesticides or anything, has been boiled and steamed off rapidly. And that's all you need. 15 seconds, get it out of there, let it cool, and now you can use it in your, aqua in your, yeah, in your aquarium. Romaine lettuce, you want to wash it really good of any kind of pesticides. And then you can put a leaf in the tank, or maybe just a, a piece of a leaf until the fish get used to it. And then as they recognize it as food, you can use a larger and larger and larger until you get the full leaf in there. But if you put a giant leaf of romaine lettuce in your tank and all the fish are staring at it from afar and aren't going near it, it you've made a mistake. If you uh, need to uh, be gone for a long time, you might think, well, this is the solution. It's not if the fish don't like what it is or are scared of it. So by using a small piece of it to, let, to introduce them to what this is and they start eating on it, that's good. And you can, any kind of food you ever use in your tank, Rather than putting it in and expecting the fish to just come over and eat some, you can take it and you can tear it up in small pieces and let it blow around in the water column and they'll sample it and they'll decide if they like it. If there's a certain food they already like and you're trying to introduce a new food, put them both in at the same time so both are moving around the tank and as they're going after the thing they always like, they might say, oh, I'll try that thing over there, it's green. And they take a bite like, oh, not too bad. And all of a sudden you see them eating both. That's great. Now they're adapted to both kinds of food but it doesn't mean it's guaranteed they'll go after a giant leaf of romaine lettuce again. So you need to figure out how to introduce them to smaller pieces, let them get used to the size, the, the way it moves in the water, how it's affixed to the tank, you know, whether it's rubber banded to a rock, if it's held on to uh, some kind of a suction cup, if you've got it connected to a, a fish scraper or a PVC pipe or a magnet. You know, the, the cleaning magnet could be another way to hold things on the glass if you're needing something. So these are ways that you can show small bits of food in the tank and get them used to it. And then, like I said, as they become more and more comfortable with it, you can use larger amounts. I remember a long time ago, I um, would buy tiger cowries, which is this huge, beautiful slug. In a, you know, it's got this gorgeous shell. And the tiger cowrie, I mean, it's just so beautiful. It's the size of a lemon. And I bought one back when I had my 29-gallon. And it didn't live a day or two. It just died so fast. I was like, oh okay what the heck and you know the tank was too small for it and so let me just clarify if you have a small tank do not get a tiger cowrie but um what happened was i tried again you know because i was young in the hobby and i didn't know what i was doing i thought oh i'll just try another one and so i went and got another one and it lived a couple more days more than the first one and i thought well that's not good what am i doing wrong here and so you know of course i'm going to think oh it's the nitrate or it's this or it's that but uh, when I was talking to them at the fish store, they said they need to eat a lot. They, they constantly are eating film algae. They're working their way over the rock. They're always looking for food. And not like frozen food, not pellet food, not flake food, like literally algae. It's looking for food that we don't normally see with our own human eyeballs. So I thought, huh, what if I took a sheet of romaine or a leaf of romaine lettuce and it, the, the lettuce will float. But if I take it, and I put it down on the bottom of the tank and take the cowrie and put it on the top of the lettuce leaf, the cowrie's body will hold the leaf down and it'll be sitting on dinner and maybe it'll eat it. And so I tried that and it worked. The cowrie ate the whole darn leaf in a matter of hours. It was just down, there was the big thick stem that um, you know nothing's gonna eat and I just threw that away. So that is one method of feeding something, but it's not uh, necessarily something you wanna do every single day. And you would want to make sure that, being that it will not be something you want to do every single day. <laughs> not that it's bad for the tank, 
So if you were to find something like nori, or I'm sorry, uh, romaine lettuce that works for one thing in your tank, and your tanks may come chew on it as well, and everyone might be sharing it, that's fine, but the actual process of putting your arm all the way to the bottom of the tank to hold the leaf down and get the slug off the glass and put it on, that seems like a little bit of overkill to me. That's not a normal... The hand of God should not be coming into your reef every single time. It's time to feed, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. So I'd much rather be able to put it on a clip, bring it down or put it near the bottom or put it near the cowrie and let it smell, turn, and start attacking it. That would be my preference. Now, um, it did eat the romaine lettuce, but it also didn't live long. I would say a matter of weeks and it was gone. I was like, okay, I'm not doing that ever again. And I didn't. I, I didn't get another one for probably 15 years. And what happens, I was in Oklahoma, I went into a fish store and there was this beautiful tiger cow. I was like, oh, I haven't had one of those in forever. And I've got a 400 gallon tank, I'm sure it'll be fine in there. And it was, and I had it in here for many years, many, many years. One day it was just dead, but I don't know their lifespan. All I know is it went everywhere and it was a bulldozer. And I remember several different times where it would just knock the entire hammer coral right here and just push it right into the sea bay anemone. And then I'd lose 10 polyps of uh, hammer coral because I flipped it up and they're all burned. And, you know, then it, you know, it would heal to recover, it started to grow. And then, you know, two months later, the cowrie pushed it <laughs> into the sea bay again. And I'm like, Ugh. but I mean, that's where the cowrie lived. It went where it wanted to go. I couldn't tell it, don't go near the hammer coral, don't push things. It just, it's one of those things you just learn to accept what your livestock is doing. It is their playground. We're just here to keep it clean and healthy. All right. Um, so I mentioned orange slices. You can definitely strap those with like a rubber band to a piece of rock and put it in the tank. And you may see that some of your fish are chewing on it. Um, you may see other things pick at it. The idea was that it was vitamin C was the premise. Uh, it's not some fantastic cure. And I would, I would just do it as something fun to do occasionally, sort of like feeding banana. Um, I have been well known for many years by a lot of people to put banana in my aquarium from time to time. And when I would take a brand new banana and I'd break it open, I'd break off the tip of it and I would just hold it in the water and Spock would come over and eat some of it. And then I'd mash it up my fingers and you'd see little bits of banana blown around the tank. The other tanks came in, start, the purple tang ate it, the yellow tang ate it, the antheus ate it, the clownfish came and ate it. And it turns out almost everything ate banana. So I do it from time to time as a treat. Um, when I say time to time, it once um, once or twice in a month it happens it's just something because what long time ago i was watching tv i was hungry and i grabbed a banana and i'm watching whatever on tv and there's this activity happening to my side and i'm just eating my banana and i look over and spock is like doing this thing like what are you doing and i'm just like what's happening why is she acting like that and she's like, seriously, what are you doing? And I'm just thinking, does she see this banana? And she's like, yes, I see it. You're eating my banana. <laughs> and I was like, man, she saw that from like eight feet away. That's crazy. So I walked over to the tank and I opened up the top and I took a little piece of banana off and I gave it to her and she was happy. And I could go back to my movie and finish eating my banana. Uh, one fun fact, when you break off some banana and feed it to your tank, you need to rinse off your fingers because if you decide to give them more banana and then you finish doing what you're doing, your banana will taste salty and that's gross. So don't do that. So I usually do one pinch. That's for the reef. The rest of the banana is for me and I go wash my hands. All right. Let's talk about liquid foods. There's quite a few choices these days of what you can use in the aquarium. Quite a few of those foods come from Reef Nutrition's. You know, that's one that's on my mind specifically. But um, trying to think who else makes liquid foods. <laughs> I'm sure there's a whole bunch, but I literally think of those little bottles from Reef Nutrition that I always see whenever we're at trade shows. And these are foods that we can pour in our tank. So I'll go grab a couple to show you what I have. Now, I told you little bottles, but of course I have big bottles. So this one here is Arctopods. 
and this is from New Reef Nutrition, and it's a bunch of concentrated Arctic copepods. They're 3,000 microns if you care about their size. And then this is a big old bottle of Phytofeast, which is actually a combination of different phytoplankton. And what you can do with these foods, you can add them to your tank anytime, but you have to keep it refrigerated so that way it doesn't spoil. And I'm sure there's probably an expiration date on here somewhere. Yeah, this needs to be used by 2-22-22. The phytoplankton is good until 7-29-22. Wow, that's a long time. Uh, so phytoplankton is a liquid food that has been used in the past to feed non-photosynthetic corals. Um, people have used it because they had a clam in their tank or they had feather dusters, you know, the filter feeders. And so they were putting phytoplankton in the system. And on my website, there's an article how to make your own phytoplankton if you want to try that. Um, I used to make it a long time ago. Maybe one day I'll do it again. But I made nanochloropsis, which is one type. And like I said, this one here is a combination of different ones. Uh, let's see what they say, because I don't remember by heart which ones are in here. They, oh, I guess they don't say. Yeah, here it is. So it's got isochrysis, pavlova. Yeah, pavlova. The, well, I can't even say this. Thalassiosira, tetraselmus, nanochloropsis, and synecococcus. <laughs> And then some other things like citric acid, larynx acid, sodium alginate, exorbic acid. Um, so there's a combination in here. This stuff's very dense. That's why it's so brown looking or, you know, it's got a hint of green to it. But normally the phytoplankton most people see is like a light green. And it's much, it, it doesn't have nearly as many cells in it. So there was a, when I was making my own phyto, you got this, cell density stick and it was an acrylic rod with markings on the side and then there was a target like a, a black dot and what you had to do was after you made your phyto you would then take the stick and you'd put it down in the into the phyto and you would look to see when the target vanished when you couldn't see the target the dot anymore when it just vanished then you looked at how deep the stick had gone in and that told you how many cells of phytoplankton were in the water and uh, <clears throat> I don't remember the details because it's too long ago. But let's just say there were 17,000 cells. I'm going to imagine this stuff is more like 150,000 cells by comparison. It's just a way more dense culture and it's a mixture. And you can't even use this to start growing your own because it's a combination blend. Whenever you try to make your own phytoplankton, you are going to use one strand of phyto and you're going to grow that. And then... When you grow it, you're literally setting up bottles with lights that light it every single day using white light. <laughs> and you're going to let it in a little bit of oxygenation, just like bubbles rising inside there quietly to keep just a slight bit of movement. And it will become greener and greener. And then after seven days to 12 days, that's usually when you want to split the phyto and you would take some of it and pour it into a separate bottle. That will be for your tank. And the rest of it you're going to use to start another bottle so you always have another bottle working, sitting on the shelf, bubbling with lights, you know, every single day to keep the colony going. And then if something goes wrong and suddenly the, the green phyto turns yellow and the bottom of the bottle is all flakes and, you know, just like this junk, you know, like, what is this? What has happened is the phyto has crashed. It's dead. You throw it away and you start with a new batch. And if you can use some of what you had before to seed a new bottle, great. But sometimes you can't and you literally have to get algae paste and you have to get fertilizer, and you have to start from scratch <laughs> to make the first batch of phyto. And then again, you do the process where you split it pretty much once a week. And that way you always have a new bottle. And I used to have two, three bottles, two liter bottles of phytoplankton in my fridge. And I had something that was like a two gallon jug in my fish room that originally was a pretzel jar from Costco. And I had three different air pipes going in there to add the bubbles. And that stuff was indestructible. I couldn't kill it if I tried. It, it just, I didn't even need to split it. I don't know what was going on with it. It was amazing. And I used that stuff for many years in my tank. And one interesting side effect of using phytoplankton in your aquarium is your glass may suddenly appear to stay clean longer. It's a very interesting side effect. I can't really explain it. I just, I'm aware of it. So if you're using it, the other thing about using phytoplankton is like I had this big bottle but I would not just start dumping in 
willy-nilly. I literally looked up what it said to use, and I believe it said for my size tank to use two tablespoons, and that was like the small dose, and then after your tank's gotten used, and this would be something you'd use each day, and then after the tank gotten used to two tablespoons a day, 450 gallon system, okay? So let's pretend much smaller tank. Like a 100 gallon tank might be one teaspoon. So you use one teaspoon a day for a week or two weeks or three weeks, and then you might try a teaspoon and a half for a week and two weeks, and then maybe two teaspoons, you know, for a week and two weeks and three weeks. And you are providing this phytoplankton to the system for things to ingest. Now, not everything will eat it, but specifically things that they suggest here are clams, feather dusters, scallops, and tunicates and some corals. Now, Eric Borneman, I was just talking to someone about this on the phone today. Eric Borneman was a, I think he was a university professor, if I'm correct. He wrote the book Corals, which is a book many of us have in our library that talks about a lot of the hard corals that are in our tanks these days. And back then he did some research. He was always doing research. And one of his studies was to actually look in the gut of a coral, which that's weird to me because when I look at a coral, I see skin and I see skeleton. But he, being the person he was, the, the professor, the scientist, he would go in there and he'd find the digestive system that's within the coral. And he found the phytoplankton cells inside SPS corals. But he also found that they, the coral could not break the phytoplankton bubble open to get the food out of it. So the nanochloropsis phytoplankton cell was like a hard, uh, like an everlasting gobstopper. <laughs> and the coral could not break it down to get the good stuff out of it. And so it would inhale it, not use it, and then eject it. So Eric's research told us back then that SPS corals can't eat phytoplankton and use it. They can eat it, but they can't use it. So that's something interesting I never forgot. I don't know if that's changed. I don't know if anything's changed over the years since then, or like be using a blended phyto, maybe the SPS can do it, but LPS corals can definitely eat this stuff. Feather dusters, uh, all the NPS corals that people love to drool over <laughs> that are so cool. NPS is non-photosynthetic. That means it's a coral that doesn't need light to live. It needs a lot of food. And people that run NPS tanks their water is always green because they're constantly putting phyto in there all the time. I mean, every single day, three, four sessions a day, phyto is, in, is injected into the system to keep the tank cloudy. And then the animals within will inhale it, process it, and the water becomes clear. Now, when you're using phytoplankton in your tank, the general rule of thumb is to turn off your protein skimmer for about an hour to let everything have a chance to get it before the skimmer can pull it out. Because another thing that Eric did at one point was he did some research on uh, the skimmate in collection cups. And he had people from all over the United States send him a sample of the sludge that came out of their, their skimmers. And he, I remember it was this huge thread on Reef Central and all the um, people were like, I'll send you some. And people from in Texas did it. He, he was here in Texas. And then there were people from other states. They were sending him all their skimmate and then he would just break it down, figure out what was in it, and then he did a report. He did an article about it. Or maybe he did something for his schools. I don't know. I'm sure he did an article as well. But um, one of the things he discovered in the collection cups, in the skimmate, was phytoplankton cells. So the skimmer definitely can take it out. You know, it also had algae and, and other stuff. But it, it was, And it was a lot of the water that was in there was just salt water. It wasn't anything evil or, or toxic. It wasn't like a a bunch of ammonia <laughs> or something you might think is in there. So it was kind of interesting to have someone do a study on skimmate. So one of the rule of thumb with one more thing I want to mention about Fido. If you're using any in your tank, the first thing you want to do when you get a brand new bottle is you want to open it up and you want to smell it. You want to know what normal smells like. So when one goes bad, you will know that it's bad and not keep pouring it into your aquarium. So if you get a bottle and it smells rank, if it smells like death, then you probably should not use it. Now, what you can do, like let's say you bought it from the fish store and it looks like it's not expired yet, but you don't know what happened. You don't know what happened during transit to the fish store. You don't know what happened in the fish store. 
was there a time when the refrigerator was off because of a power outage? You know, did things spoil and they just got it cold again and they're selling it to you anyway? I mean, these are things that can happen that are beyond our control. We're not even aware of it half the time because we walk into a store once in a blue moon. We don't know what happens 24 seven all the time. So you wanna find out and you might go up to the store and say, hey, I got this bottle from you. It smells funny. Can we smell another bottle just to make sure it's okay or just double check? And that way you can verify the food so you're not pouring in something that's toxic that could hurt your system. We wanna make sure that it's healthy and safe and beneficial to the tank. So this goes with any food. Um, one thing, you know, while I'm talking about things that are spoiled, something that many of us do accidentally, because of course you wouldn't do this on purpose, we forget to put the frozen food back in the freezer when we're done. Like we broke open some stuff, we fed our aquarium, we drink a cup of coffee, we're watching TV, or the next morning we walk in the kitchen to make some coffee and oh my God, it left the frozen food out all night. Is it still good? No, it's not good. It's not worth the risk. Just throw it away, go buy some new. Don't make that mistake twice. And to be honest, if you have to throw it away, you will not make that mistake twice because it costs you money and you will think, nope, I'm not spending, I'm not wasting money like that again, but don't use it because it's been sitting out. It's just, it's not safe. So we don't want to do that. Um, also, I know some people say certain things on the web and I always have to ask them to explain what they mean because what I'm reading sounds like one thing, but what they meant to type could be something entirely different. And that is, they might say, oh, I saw my frozen food in the refrigerator all week long. And I'm like, what do you mean? You have food that was frozen that you've had in the fridge for seven days melted and you're putting that in your tank? I'm like, oh no. I put some in all week long to thaw. In other words, I take food out and I put it in the fridge for tonight. And that way it's, by the time I come home from work, it's melted and I can throw it in the tank easily. And then that night I'll put frozen food in the fridge for the next night. I'm like, okay, all right, I respect that. I understand it, it makes sense. If you, um, but don't just get some frozen food and try to make a soupy concoction that you keep in the fridge like you know, um, like leftovers and expect it to be good seven days from now. That is not what any of the frozen food vendors are gonna recommend with their product. They're gonna tell you to break off some and put it in the tank. And there's lots of ways of putting it in the tank. I'm gonna put these back in the fridge and I'll come right back. My preferred method of putting frozen food in the tank is to thaw it in advance. And there are two ways of doing it. There's one way that I've always done, and then there's another way that I've been doing for some time now because of my tank sitter, and I love it. And people are like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you what I did in the past. I would break out all my frozen pieces of different flavors, Rod's food, Hikari mices, Pro Salt, Krill, and PE mices, and I'd have this bowl of chunky bits, right? They're all hard frozen. I would dip that little bowl into the tank to get some salt water on it. And I'd set it on the counter in about 15 minutes. It's, it's soft and melted. I can stir it up and it's just like a cloudy soup. And then I can go ahead and feed it to my different tanks. The other method that I've become adept at, and I've been doing it now for a very long time, I, I, a year, two years, I don't know, longer. I do the same thing with the bowl. I put all my nuggets in there and I dip it into the tank to get the little bit of tank water in there. And I put it in my microwave for 20 seconds. And what that does is the water, the salt water gets heated up, but the frozen food doesn't get cooked because it's only 20 seconds. And you can do 15 seconds or 10 seconds, or you cannot do this at all. I'm just telling you what I do and uh, that's fine. But I'm doing it just enough to make the water hot, hotter. <laughs> and then I stir it with my little pipette. And then like a minute and a half later, it's a, it's a soup, it's ready to go. The frozen stuff melts really quickly and I can get in my tank in about two minutes flat. So that is the other approach. But if you prefer the more logical, let it sit on the counter 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that's totally fine. That's probably better than my method. But what I've been doing has been working for a very long time with no adverse results, no weirdness. I'm not cooking the food because it's still frozen because it was only a matter of seconds. And like, I mean, it's just something I do that makes my life a little bit easier. So if you want to try that, let me know what happens for you. I'd, I'd love to know. Now, I realize that it also matters how much food you're using and how much water you're using and how strong your microwave is. But it's just a method I use um, that seems to work well for me. 
if you wanted to use live foods, there are different types on the market of again, and then there are some that people grow at home. So for example, um, copepods. Most people don't grow copepods. They will buy them in bottles from different companies, and then they pour it into their tank to provide live bugs for certain fish in their aquarium to consume. For example, mandarins love copepods. That is their main staple. That is the one food they want, and it's the least food we ever have. So the arctopods is a type of um, refrigerated copepod that a mandarin could possibly eat. Now, my fish eat it like candy. I mean, they do, but I don't have any mandarins right now. So if I were to get a mandarin or two, like from Biota, those fish are tank-raised and trained to eat fish food and not seek out the food that they normally would find in the ocean if they'd been born in the ocean. And so they would be easier to get onto something like arctopods. And of course, adding tigger pods and copepods, these are things we want to put in our tank that are beneficial and create live food for the aquarium. But something very common that people like to grow besides phytoplankton would be brine shrimp. And brine shrimp um, can be purchased as encapsulated or decapsulated eggs that you put in brine water, which would be salt water, but not as salty as our reef. And you oxygenate it for about 24 hours. And then you turn off the pump and you let the water sit and all the live brine noptili, which are noptili, which are the little hatchlings with their yolk sac still attached after 24 hours, that's great food. And then the water will separate. And so you'll have all the noptili at the bottom of your container and you'll have water and they have this horrible brown stuff on the top. That's the eggs, the, the shells. If you can imagine eggs cracked in half, all the shells are floating at the top. And so I was using a type of brine shrimp, hat, brine shrimp hatchery that used a two liter bottle. And <clears throat> it screwed into this base that had a nipple that went to the airline tubing. The tubing went to an air pump and that would send bubbles up. But when I disconnected the pump and I let it sit for about five minutes or so for it to separate, then I could take that tubing and I could lower it into a brine shrimp net and I could let the, the water, the noptili, the water, the casings, it would just gradually go down as it's draining out the bottom into my net. And I would capture the noptili. And as soon as I got that, I just threw the hose into the sink and let the rest of the water and the egg casings fall into the sink while I took my net full of live brine shrimp and I would set it loose in the tank and a thousand, I don't know, 10,000, whatever it was, a million little tiny brine shrimp were squirting all over the water and the fish went crazy and were eating the confetti. And the reason that we want to use 24 hour brand new uh, hatched brine shrimp is because it's the most nutritious. Some breeders would even take the brand, well, actually what they would do, they grow the brine shrimp and then before they were doing the separation part, they'd add phytoplankton into the hatchery so that the brine shrimp would ingest the phyto and then they would stop the flow, separate it, catch the noptili. And that was called gut loading brine shrimp. And they'd be, their gut would be loaded with phyto. And then anything that ate it would eat brine shrimp, the yolk sac, and the phyto. It got all three things into their bellies. And it was considered a really cool way to feed your fish. And so a lot of people did that. And then for a long, long time, lots of SPS keepers were trying or were talking about growing rotifers. Rotifers, to my naked eye, looks like a speck of dust moving through the water. It's just nothing. It's dust. It doesn't look like anything. Now, I never got to you know look at one myself under a microscope, but when I would see a container filled with rotifers, it was just dust. And I was like, I can't believe the corals eat this stuff. And there were some of my friends would grow rotifers just like they grew phytoplankton. And then again, they gut loaded the rotifers with phytoplankton and then they'd pour it through a very, very fine micron sieve to capture the gut loaded rotifers. And then they would pour that in the tank and they said, my SPS corals are eating this. Now, I haven't heard of anyone doing that in a very long time, but I'm going to assume, because I'm not a fish breeder, that fish breeders are growing rotifers for their brand new baby fish fry. 
And so for them, it's probably a very normal thing to make. But most reef hobbyists don't grow rotifers. They may grow brine shrimp and they may grow phytoplankton. It depends how much you want to do yourself versus buying things that you can just throw in the fridge and offer to your tank. But it is an option and you might be in, you might be so inclined. On my website, there's an article on how to make your, you know, DIY your own brine shrimp. There's the article on how to make your own phytoplankton. There's an article of how to make your own frozen food. So all those are on there. You can just go into the search box and type in whatever it is you're looking for and it'll take you to those articles. Now, powdered foods is another kind of food that you can use and it's one I've been using quite a bit for the last few years. And specifically, I talk about Benna Reef, which is by Benna Pets. And it is a powdered food that is kept in a, in a jar with desiccant, so it will not get moisture in it. And the powdered food would be, you, know, you take the right amount for your aquarium, and I believe it's a quarter teaspoon per 25 gallons. So in my tank, it's like two tablespoons. And I will put that in a cup of tank water, and I stir it with a plastic spoon, because I always like to use plastic with anything going in the aquarium rather than a metal spoon, just because. And then you have to let it sit for five minutes to activate, because Benef, Benef, I'm trying to say Benefits, when I want to say Benef Reef. Benef Reef has bacteria in it, and if you give it a chance to activate before you put it in the tank, it will be more beneficial to the tank. So it will um, add some fresh bacteria to your system. And interestingly, like the phytoplankton dosing, when you feed Benef Reef to, I keep wanting to say Benefits because that's the brand. Uh, when you put Benna Reef in your tank, your glass may appear to stay clean longer. And that's not some weird side effect. I mean, I've seen it happen time after time after time. And to be honest, if I were to use it every single day, I probably would never have to clean my glass again. <laughs> it's weird how it works. It, it's funny. I like it. But uh, I tend to use it about once a week. And it's what I, and there's two ways of using this powdered food. You can mix it up like I described in a cup of water and then you pour that into your tank and you turn off your protein skimmer for an hour and it just broadcasts it everywhere and whatever wants to eat it can eat it. And if it finds anything bigger that it can consume in its mouth, it will, but most of it's gonna be very, very fine and uh, just tiny particulates, plankton size, and the, all the little SPS polyps that are out will be grabbing it. Um, you may see uh, ornamental shrimp grabbing at it. If you have porcelain crabs, they'll grab it on their nets and lick it off. So it's really good for the entire reef. And the cool thing about Benna Reef, you don't end up with cyanobacteria. And that is one of those things that um, if something causes cyan on my tank, I don't want to use it. Like if it's literally cause and effect. And for example, you know, I, I said really good things about reef nutrition. The one food that I do not like from them is oyster feast. And Oyster Feast is considered the best of the best. And if I just put a few drops of it in my tank, it's insane, I get cyano immediately. Like the next day, there's cyano. And I'm just, I've seen it happen every single time I try to use it. Years ago, I had a frag tank over on this side of my reef on the end. And the tank, the reef would drain into the sump. A small pump or a part of my manifold fed water into the frag tank and it drained back into the sump. So it was all part of the same ecosystem. And it was a 10 gallon tank and I had sun corals in there and I had, that was weird. Now we'll see if we stay connected. We just had a kind of a blink of a power outage. <laughs> um, so I was trying to feed the sun corals in that tank and I thought I'll use oyster feast because it's like the best food ever. And so I would turn off the flow to that tank and I'd put in three or four drops in the 10 gallons of water and I'd wait like 30 minutes and I'd open the valve and let the food, or let the food and the water and everything drain back in the sump. And then the next day my reef had cyanobacteria. And like I said, this happened so many different times that I finally said I'll never use Oyster Feast again. I don't have that problem with Benareef. And you can use Benareef, like I said, as a broadcast feeder or you can use it as a, um, oh, we are definitely gonna lose our power. That's the second time. Let me know if you're still able to hear me. I'm curious. I'm gonna do something right, right quick.
think I still have internet. All right, I'm just going to assume we're still there. I don't know what's going on. This is the second time and like out of nowhere, but nothing else got dimmed. The computer didn't dim down. The lights didn't turn off on above me here. Camera's still going. So sort of like happening in there only. We'll have to see what's going on. Um, all right, so I use Ben Arif because I can trust it and I don't have any issues. Another food that was used, a powdered food that was very popular back in the day was called Golden Pearls. That might still exist. It may not. Um... And then reefroids is another popular one many people like to use. I personally don't use reefroids. So again, because it creates cyan on my tank. I don't know why, but it just does. And so I will use the things that don't cause the problem so I don't have to fight the problem. And that's why you never see cyan on my tank because there are certain things I choose not to use. Um, you can, in recent years, uh, people have been leaning into using more and more vitamins. Uh, there is the Red Sea Coral ABCD kit where it has different elements in there. It's going to have your iodine, your potassium, and it's going to have vitamins in there. And you're putting that in the tank and it's supposed to give you more colors, more rich coral color. And so that is a popular choice. Uh, back in, uh, I remember there were threads, hundreds of threads back in the day where they talked about dosing vitamin C specifically the tank to make zoanthids look better and grow faster. And the thing is, these are, again, like the phytoplankton, you have to ramp up gradually. You can't just put it in your tank and then expect to see more zoanthids. It needs to be, like, use a tiny bit, and you use that tiny bit every day for a week, two, three, four weeks, and then you increase it slightly, and that is your daily dose for a long time, and then you increase it slightly to you eventually get up to a teaspoon worth. You know, see what I'm saying? It's just, it's very, very, you use minute parts in your tank, and you gradually see how it affects the, the reef and if it's doing anything beneficial. And if you can't see any benefit at all, then you just don't do it at all. Now, uh, I, you guys know that I use Prodibio in my tank every 15 days. I just did it last night. Part of Prodibio comes with a liquid food called Reef Booster. And I personally don't really like using Reef Booster because it, number one, makes my tank really loud. It suddenly drains like a freshwater tank and it just, it's, surging and burping and gurgling and it's really loud for a long time like eight nine hours and uh the other thing is it makes my protein skimmer go crazy and then i have to spend a lot of effort to get the skimmer back under control and the same thing happens with coral vits so while these are available and i actually have them i only use them rarely if i'm in some weird mood i think if i wanted to use reef booster or coral vits or both at the same time which is how it's designed to be used i might do it the night before I'm gonna do a water change on the tank. So that way I can just do the water change and the protein scammer will settle down and I can get back to my normal life. But I am so used to having a tank that's nice and quiet that I don't like doing things to it that makes it loud. And so I choose not to use those two um, available items even though they are in my wheelhouse. All right, so let's talk about some rules um, as we wrap this up. Man, I've been talking a long time. Um, First thing I want to tell you is that before you ever feed anything to your tank, you should wash your hands thoroughly first. We don't want to have anything on our hands that can get into the tank and pollute it while we're feeding our fish because we love them. So if you have oils, uh, perfumes, deodorants, um, uh, lotions, you work on cars and you're a mechanic, you know, I mean, you just want to have clean hands before you put your hands in the tank. If you cannot get them clean enough for whatever reason, you can always get the disposable rubber gloves that you put on so that way as you handle the food, you are not polluting your tank with whatever is on your skin. It's very important. Um, and this is going to sound crazy, but don't touch your dog before you put your hand in the tank either. So this is another one of those weird stories that you read and you're just like, I can't believe this actually happened. But at the same time, I believe it. So this one guy came home from work, saw his dog scratching behind the head, got some fish food, and was holding his hand in the tank and doing this, you know, with, to disperse the food into the water column. And stuff just started dying before his eyes. And he couldn't understand what was happening. And of course, he jumped on the forums and he was like, oh my God, what do I do? What, you know, what could have happened? And it didn't take long for him to figure out what had happened. His wife had just put that flea and tick stuff 
on the back of the dog's neck just before he got home. So there was that little damp spot right there. He scratched the dog, got the chemicals on his hand. Now he's holding the food in the water and he's doing this and he's literally dispersing that medication into his reef and it was killing things. And so, uh, you know, he lost pods and worms and, and shrimp, you know, things died fast. And it was all because of not rinsing his hands first. So wash your hands, don't touch anything. Don't touch your kid, don't touch your dog, don't touch your cat, <laughs> don't touch yourself. Touch the food, feed the tank. Um, the food itself, if you had, let's pretend this is a big old jar of Benarif, okay? Because that's about the size. And uh, if you have food like this, I would never just scoop it out and do this in my tank. I would also never just do this into my tank because you could be pouring a little bit in and then a big amount just boof, and boof, just hits the whole tank and goes everywhere. So your best method of any kind of food to your tank would be to put it in a separate container. I mentioned to you my little plastic bowls. Those little bowls, um, I have been using them forever. They're actually the little individual uh, fruit cups or applesauce cups you give to a kid in their pack lunch. And rather than throw them away, I just saved them. And I can put frozen food into them and thaw them with tank water. I can mix up caulk paste in there to kill Aptasia. I can mix a Benarif in there and stir and let it sit. I mean, very practical. And again, I'm holding what's going to go in the tank and nothing else. So there's no chance of spilling it in. If you have a big jar of pellet food and it has like a small hole on the side, you might think you could just shake it in like you're doing salt and pepper. But if the top pops off and all the frozen the, the pellet food goes in, that's bad. So rather hold the jar and maybe go into your palm and then put it into the tank. Also, jars of fish food should not be sitting on the top of your aquarium. A lot of people like to do that for convenience sake or maybe to remind them to feed their fish. But uh, And this is not as much a problem as it was back in the old days with metal halides. But they'd put their fish food on top of the light fixture. <clears throat> And the fixture is hot because the lights are running all day. And the food in the jar would bake and it would actually burn off the, the beneficial. Uh, it would just ruin the food, basically. And you don't want to ruin your food. So take the food you're going to use and then put the jar under the tank somewhere cool and dry and away from direct light. It doesn't need to be baked by sunlight. It doesn't need to be sitting on top of a hot light or the heat sink of an LED fixture or anything like that. It should be somewhere safe and away from the aquarium so it cannot be bumped in and spilled into the aquarium. <clears throat> I prefer to thaw my fish food, but like I started to mention earlier, there are some foods you can put directly in the tank as a frozen piece and let the fish gnaw on it. And Roger's Food is apparently one of those. Now, the new owner of Roger's Food contacted me and he sent me some food to try out, and I got it just before I left town. It's in my freezer. I haven't tried it out yet. But he recommended you put it inside a mesh type of a plastic sack inside your tank and let the fish just chew on it all day long. And so I will be trying that out to see how I like it and see how the fish like it. But that normally I say just thaw your food. But I think his, if it was thawed, it's still kind of rubbery rather than being lots of little pieces of food. And so that's why the fish tear it apart versus um, something that just disperses. I'm checking my notes, make sure I don't forget anything. Okay, let's talk about target feeding because I didn't mention anything about that. Uh, like if you were taking Benarif and you're mixing it up in a cup and pouring it, it goes everywhere and everything has an equal opportunity to get some. But target feeding is when you mix up the food in a thicker solution, like, like a paste or a slurry. And you might use a pipette or a turkey baster, or um, I guess that's the only two I can think of right now that you could do to get food onto a coral. And you would stop all the flow in the tank, and then you would squirt the food with the turkey baster or the pipette directly at the coral in question. And when we're trying to feed those corals, we're trying to get the food on the coral, and hopefully other things won't steal that food before the coral can ingest it. So if you were to take the food and put it in the tank, and it lands on the coral and you walk away and then your tangs come over and your angels come over and your clowns come over and your shrimp come over and your uh, your starfish climbs up on top of it. I mean, that, and the mandarin shows up. That's, that's what it's like. So if you can feed your whole tank first, like feed all the fish so their, their stomachs are kind of full and they're fat and sassy again, 
then you could target feed corals and perhaps have better luck letting the coral get some of that food before it either gets blown away or stolen by the tank mate. Now, when you're doing this, what you can do is you can put the food on the coral. And then, like I said, we want to stop the flow, but you may discover something still comes over to steal it, like a cleaner shrimp. They're really bad about this. Like, let's say you're trying to feed pellet food or krill or some kind of a paste to a lobophilia or to a fungia or to um, acans, for example. You may try putting food or giving food directly to the shrimp so he's occupied working on that. But they may say, thank you, take it, throw it aside, and still go investigate what you're doing. And if you literally cannot feed this one coral in question, and especially if this coral is not doing well and it's uh, it's essentially starving because everything keeps stealing its opportunity of getting a meal, what you may need to do is actually make a dome that goes over the coral to protect it. So what you can do is you can take a two liter bottle, cut it in half or cut it in a third or whatever, and take the dome part, the top, drill a bunch of holes in it so that water can get through the holes. And then you'll take the dome and you'll press it down over the coral and into the sand so it holds tight. And then using the turkey baster or the pipette, you can squirt the food directly into the acans that you're trying to feed or the, the fungia or whatever it is. And then the shrimp comes over but can't get in. Hermit crabs can't get in. Fish can't come steal it. It's a really good method that works. But the reason I tell you to drill all those holes in the dome is because if you don't and you push the dome down on there, that area will lose its oxygen level and the coral will turn very pale over a matter of hours, especially if you forget to remove that dome overnight. Let's say you put it in there, it's 11 o'clock at night, you put the dome on there, you squirted in some food, and you went to bed, and then the next day you woke up, and you're like, oh, I left the dome in there, and you lift it off, and that coral's super pale. Don't know how, don't ask me how I know this. <laughs> but anyway, if you drill the holes, water still moves through it, but the food doesn't get swiped, doesn't get stolen. And this works really, really well. If, um, if you're tank is bare bottom and you don't have sand to press the dome into, the dome will probably float off or lift away. You could take a hot glue gun and some glass beads and you can actually glue the beads around the dome to make the base heavy so it sits over the coral and you still have the way to isolate the coral to give it its meal. And then like a, you know, set a timer on your watch or your phone and then 30 minutes later or an hour later, take the dome away and hopefully the coral by then has inhaled it. It does take time. There have been times where I fed a certain coral uh, like lobos, you know, these, uh, well, they're hiding over here and there's some over here. They, um, they are a big polyp. They're very slow eaters. And I would put krill on there or pellet food or whatever. And I would guard it. I'd put fish nets around it, whatever I could to protect it from, you know, my shrimp. And then the food went inside the corals like, okay, he's got it. You're good. And I put all my stuff away, turn the flow back on. And I'd watch the cleaner shrimp run over there or the peppermint shrimp run over to that coral take its claw and reach into the mouth of the coral and pull the food out and take it away. I'm like, I cannot believe that. I just spent an hour trying to get food into that coral and you just stole it. So keep an eye on things and try to figure out what's the right duration for your tank that assures that the coral you're trying to feed gets its meal without it being stolen. I do like to feed hammer corals and frog spawns with some kind of target feeding from time to time, but broadcast feeding is so much easier, but it is fun to target feed because when you stop all the flow in the tank, I mean, literally no power heads are on, no return pump is going, and then you squirt food at these corals, you'll see like, for example, a hammer or a frog spawn, for example, you see all those tentacles normally. Instead, the tentacles will all spread out and you'll actually see the mouth and the mouth will open up. And if you stand there and watch, I mean, it's slow motion, but you can see the particles of food are slowly being vacuumed into that mouth. It's a very interesting process. And then eventually you don't see it and the mouth closes up and then out's inside the gut of the coral. So you can do that, but you have to remember to turn the flow back on. Super important. So many people make the mistake of not turning on their flow and they end up losing fish and corals the next day because they forgot. So set those timers or use some kind of option like a feed mode in your controller that disables things for the duration you prefer. 10 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, whatever it is. But after that, the default is on and turns everything back on again. Very important. I talked about um, turning off your protein skimmer for certain foods. I normally like to just turn off my return pump entirely when I feed the tank and it's off for 10 minutes. 
And when my proteins, I mean, when my return pump is off, my protein skimmer is off as well at the same time. The reason being that when you turn off the return pump, the tank will drain some water into the sump and the water in the sump will rise. Well, if my protein skimmer is sitting in this much water all the time and running perfectly, when the water is this high in the sump, the skimmer will overflow. So when I set up my system, I have a big button on the side I push and it turns off the return pump and it turns off the skimmer and the water in the um, sump rises, the skimmer is off, doesn't matter. And then after 10 minutes, the return pump turns on and pushes water back in the tank and the water level goes back to its normal height. And five minutes later, my protein skimmer turns on. That is uh, my method that works for me. If for some reason I was feeding a different kind of food, longer contact time or dwell time in the system, I would change how long my feed mode is for my system to keep those two devices off. And then, like I said, I would still have the skimmer stay off for an extra five minutes while everything's ramping back up to normal. Um, some livestock in your tank, you may need to feed, you know, we talk about uh, target feeding. If you have eels or you have, uh, let's say you have a dwarf lionfish, like a Fu Manchu, they need a little bit of food, but they may not be at the surface. So you may need a feeding stick or tongs or some kind of a, uh, trying to think what it's called. It's like a claw with a long handle, and you can actually bring the food down to that livestock and hold it in front of the fish or you're trying to feed, and then it will come out, and then it grabs it, and you retract your tool from the water column, and that way you know that eel got its food. To just drop in chunks of krill and hope your eel finds it is a bad method. Or if you're trying to feed a piece of scallop or a, a chunk of a mussel, something, something meaty, octopus, squid, whatever, you want to make sure that the animal in question gets the meal, you would do that. And if you're trying to feed anemones, a lot of people are told from the fish store, use silver sides. Silver sides are usually fish about this long, maybe slightly long, you know, shorter, and it's just a big old fish. And your anemone is either this size or this size or this size or this size. They don't tell you how much silver side to use. So you come home, you think, I'll just stick a fish in there, and the anemone will eat that fish. We don't need to feed it nearly that much food. And if you are feeding anemones meaty foods, and it's so much food that it comes out uh, of the anemone later, and it is um, just this big, white, disgusting mass, this blob of poop, uh, you've put too much in the anemone. So instead, I would usually recommend, if you're going to feed your anemone, go ahead and just cut off a small piece of meaty food the size of a lima bean, and put that in the anemone to eat. And you can do that once or twice a week, like once every three days. And that is enough food, trust me. I literally do not feed any of mine and I have hundreds of anemones in the anemone cube as well as the sea bay in here and some other little stragglers. And none of them are getting food directly. I'm not feeding them anything. And they continue to live and make more of themselves. So you don't need to actually put food in them. But if you are giving them food, size of a lima bean is the rule every three days. And that works out just fine. They are going to inhale all the other food too. So it's not like they're only getting a meal every three days. I'm still encouraging you to feed your tank every single day. But if you'll do what I'm suggesting, you won't see any anemone poop at all, ever, never. It'll never happen. They will take in that little bit. They will completely use it up and they won't have to expel anything because there's nothing left. They used it all. So that's pretty much everything I have to say about feeding. I hope that you found this interesting and useful and beneficial and practical. And let's go ahead and get into our question and answer part now because uh, I've been ignoring the chat the entire time while I've been focused on staying on topic. So thank you for your attention and I'm gonna scroll way up. And I'm going to be right back. Starting to get a headache. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Let's see. 
John says, you started the hobby the year after I graduated from high school. <laughs> uh, Brad says, I was watching an old video you did on carbon and iodine. I saw it's important for soft leather corals. Is that true? Would a 25% weekly water change be adequate for a light, lightly stocked system? 25% is a lot. Uh, you only need to do 25% per month on your aquarium to be keeping up with what the tank needs. But running carbon is beneficial in a mixed reef system where you have different corals that normally would not live near each other. The carbon kind of deals with the chemical warfare between those corals and makes things work out better. So I usually recommend running carbon for a few days once a month, and you can do your 25% water change uh, once a month, and that should be enough. Now, iodine, when it hits the water, doesn't last long. Um, it, it's gone quickly. I, I don't know the exact amount, but I feel like it's like 24 hours. So normally what we do is we just dose a little bit of iodine once a week. And there are different kinds. Lugol Solution has always been my choice, which is a very concentrated kind. And that one is one drop per 50 gallons. And you would do that once a week. And if you follow that recipe you will not overdose it, you will not hurt your tank. And if you do an ICP test from time to time, you will see your iodine level and see if it's working. Now, I'll just go into this really quickly and I'll go to the next question. But when I had problems with my tank a few months ago, the, uh, the ICP test that came back showed my iodine was you know, at a certain level. And at the time, I didn't believe the results, not of the iodine, just the results were weird. And I thought that's strange. And I talked with a couple of my friends and they said, you should send in another sample immediately and then compare and make sure that everything matches because with those results, I would not just start fixing it until I knew for a fact they're right. I said, okay. So I, in the meantime, had dosed Prodibio in my tank, which was BioDigest, Bioptim, Stronti Plus, and IOD Plus. IOD Plus is iodine. And I had dosed that in my tank that night while I'm looking at these results of my ICP test saying, this is strange. And by the way, my iodine level is whatever it is. I, I don't remember. Let's just pretend it was um, 0.01 PPM, okay? So the next day I sent, I, I scooped a new sample of water out of my tank. I shipped it overnight to Denver. That next night they came back with the results. And I just happened to notice the iodine level had risen slightly from the test that I had taken of the sample from a week before. And remember, I had just put in IOD plus the night before. So I actually had physical proof that dosing of the iodine had risen it slightly and it was still within the right range. It wasn't like too much or anything like that. It was just one of those little anecdotal things I caught in the corner of my eye. I was way more worried about potassium and calcium and alkalinity and the big things, but I was glancing at things like lithium and lanthanum and iodine and iron, you know, these things that, you know, we also care about. And it was just interesting to see what I poured in the tank had actually made an impact on the test. All right. Ooh, I'm gonna have a bad headache today, I can tell. I may not last long, guys. We'll see how long I can go here with some of your questions. Sorry about that. Pon Pon asks, what is the highest level of potassium that is safe for a reef tank? Well, um, that's a loaded question because if you watched my interview with Justin Credible uh, that I put here on the YouTube channel about three weeks ago, two weeks ago, he, uh, had made, he had made the point that he had had some tanks where he had a level of 1,200 parts per million potassium in the tank and the corals were doing great. He says... The bare minimum he would recommend to anyone, including a brand new person in the hobby, is 420. So my choice is going to be to stay above 400, probably around 450. And Joe's 20,000 gallon reef that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, his he keeps his at 450. So 400 to 450 would be the target range I'm going to pretty much promote to other people that are worrying about potassium at all. So that way you know what to shoot for, and you're not just throwing things in your tank and hoping. You're going to need to own a potassium test kit as well. And uh, Salaford is the one everyone keeps telling me is the best one to use. 
I have not used it yet. I keep saying I'm going to order it, and I just never get around to it. So that will happen soon. Hey, Mike, thank you so much for the super chat. I am only now seeing it, but I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Sean says, my tangs will yell at me when I don't give them nori by 6 or 7 p.m. You know, if you feed at a very specific time every single day, your fish will learn that clock and they will be waiting at that exact period for you to show up with food. And so when I go out of town and my tank setter takes over, which is rare now because of what's been going on, but I always feed like really late in the night. I don't even know why I do it. I mean, I kind of do, but it's not like I thought out this, this ultimate plan. My uh, thought was feed the fish just before lights out that way, the extra food that's in the water column, the cloudiness that we see you know, briefly, can be inhaled by the corals because the corals are still open while the fish are all in bed. And so that's kind of been my method for a super long time. My tank sitter shows up before the lights even turned on. And so I said to him, you know, because I looked at my alarm system and I could see when he turned it on and off. I said, so when you come at 1030 in the morning, <laughs> There's some daylight coming in through the patio doors. Are you turning on lights for the fish to see? And he says, oh, that only happened once. Normally, I don't come that early. But that day, I did come that early. And I did feed the fish, and they were fine. I was like, all right. Because my fish are trained for 11 o'clock at night, basically. And so it was. I was kind of curious how that even works out when lights haven't even kicked on yet. Because my, my first lights don't even turn on until 1130. And he was here before that. So I was wondering if he was turning on the light in the room behind me to, you know, get some kind of light thrown into the room for ambient light. And uh, he just answered me like that was a one-time thing. But he does tend to come around 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, so he's completely off of my schedule. And, I, I mean, my fish, they see a human being walking by. They're, they're going to do a little bit of begging anyway. But he, um, he feeds at a different time than I do. But I, I tend to stay at that same schedule. And so my fish will all gather this end of the tank a lot around 9 30 10 o'clock 10 30 11 o'clock and usually it's, i'm feeding them right at 11 o'clock ricky says so i'm about to give this tank up all i've seen all i seem to do is kill coral well ricky i'm going to tell you that if you keep watching this channel maybe we can help you and you can be more successful if you have not become a member of club Mila's reef on facebook you should join us i haven't put this thing on the screen in forever see so it's just facebook.com slash groups slash milos reef and just join our group we're a really good group of people there's about nine thousand of us in there and we are there to help we don't attack each other we don't, I don't even allow it there's actually a rules video that you should watch when you join so you understand how we work but uh, we are there to help you figure out what's going on with your tank and to be successful there are certain things that we may be able to help you figure out there may be certain things you will read and learn and you'll figure out on your own. And that way you can start putting things in your tank and they do well. But there is a science behind this. It's not just a matter of putting things in and it just works out. There is some real effort involved and that's why I've been doing this YouTube channel for so long to help people like you be more successful. John says, a steak knife will grate the frozen food as you cut it up. I like to use those little ketchup sauce cups from the restaurants that they use for the to-go to sauces. Um, a little tank water mixed in with food, and there it is, ready to go. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I have not tried to, like, I mean, I know what you're saying about the serrated knife. I've not tried to, like, scrape it, but that's one method. But I think as you're cutting down, it will kind of uh, get you some thinner wafer slices, too. Depends how much you're slicing. But, yeah, I could see how that would work. And it would cut up bigger pieces into smaller pieces. Paul, I already talked about this earlier, but since I'm seeing your question now, I'll answer you directly. Uh, I mix it with tank water rather than RO water. And uh, something I didn't even mention at all is that I don't throw away the liquid. I never have and I never will. I know some, uh, some people firmly believe that as they melt the food, that water is loaded with phosphate. Well, of course it is. And so they say, well, I don't want to put phosphate in my tank. So they pour out all the liquid and then all the melted food, the chunks, they put that in the tank and that's it. Well, for me, melting it in tank water and turning it into a slurry and then putting in the big pieces and the cloudy stuff, everything gets a chance to get a bite of it. You know, even the things with the tiniest mouths will inhale some of the cloudy 
flavorful food uh, that I've put in the system. So that's why I don't drain off the liquid. I put everything into the tank. Tim is recommending that I get a UV sterilizer. Thanks. Alex says, when I feed my tang veggie flakes, my carnivore wrasse will try eating it. Is he going to be fine? Yes, he will. Uh, another Alex said, nope, same Alex. No, different Alex says, reef nutrition is my favorite pellet food because it's the only food my mandarin dragonette will eat when I got it three years ago. It's still going strong in a 20 gallon. Wow, good job. Uh, Bill says, do you use a filter sponge in your sump at the end before your return pump? If not, why not? My sump is baffles and water just goes from zone to zone. There's no, there's nothing in there to trap particulates. The protein skimmer pulls out the big stuff and what little bits um, blow around either settle in the sump to be vacuumed out later or they end up back in the reef as food. But I don't have any sponges or floss or, or filter socks or anything like that. I very rarely use those. It's just occasionally. And I, part of the, my thought process, there was a couple of reasons. I didn't like the constant cleaning that was involved in always cleaning socks. I mean, if you do filter socks and you're catching it, or if you have one of those sponges jammed in the baffle, they get densed up with all this stuff. And you have to take it apart and you have to clean it. And if you don't clean it, it, it obstructs the water and then the water can't get through it anymore and ends up going higher and higher and flooding over to the next zone anyway, which makes it pointless because now it's just a brick wall in the way. So that was one reason. And then the other one was back when I was feeding things like phytoplankton and baby brine shrimp. I actually didn't turn off my return pump back then. I would just turn off the skimmer. So any food that went down the drain could then come back up because it wasn't trapped in a sponge or in a mesh bag or in a filter sock. So that is why I don't have any kind of a mechanical filtration other than the protein skimmer itself. Mike says, this was a nice stream. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Sean has been using the Piscine Energetics Mysis pellets. You know, I have two. So they come in one, two, and three millimeter sizes. I mix them up for all the fish sizes. See, there he goes, mixing up the different sizes, different blends to get the uh, different mouths of the tank all equally satisfied. I like it. I got some of that uh, P.E. Mysis pellet food in the past. I won some in a contest when I was at one of the shows. They had a spinning wheel and you spun the wheel and if it landed on Mysis, you got to pack it. And so I got some of that. I also, did you know they also make a flake food? So I used that until the jar was empty. <laughs> Lucas says, how would you raise phosphate? Mine are stuck at 0.00, .00 since the start of August. And some of my corals started bleaching, hammers mostly. Well, you can literally dose neophos to raise phosphate in your tank. You can run your skimmer less. You can feed your tank more. <laughs> These are some of the things. Um, and then analyze what it is you're doing in your system that is maybe removing the phosphate. Like if you're running GFO, you could stop or you could use less of it. Um, if you, I mean, you have to look at all the things you're putting in the tank to figure out what's removing it. Because you said it's all of a sudden at 0 0.00. So that means previously it was somewhere higher than that, I'm assuming. And something has changed in your tank. So we want to figure out what that is. But at the very least, you can dose it if you need to, to get the number up a little bit. We don't want to go really high, but uh, I would suggest not being scared of reaching 0.1 ppm. That's okay. I know the goal originally, way back in the day, was 0.03. But you know what? There's a lot of tanks out there that are 0.1, that are 0.25, that are 0.75, that are lovely, beautiful reef tanks full of ha happy, healthy corals and fish. So I, the biggest reason people want low phosphate is they don't want to have algae in their tank. But if you have a really well-balanced reef with a lot of hungry mouths and you have a good cleanup crew, and you have um, herbivore fish in there to mow down anything that's trying to show up on the rock. Like you'll see Spock going around and gnawing on some of the different rocks from time to time. Oh, I'll turn this thing off. Um, 
that right there will allow the the tank to look algae free even though you have phosphate in the water so don't fear phosphate i never have myself <laughs> redneck reefer's wife just called me mr rogers or the reef keepers it's <laughs> funny i should have wore my sweater my cardigan I'm looking for the next question, guys, in case you're wondering. Adam says, Spock is extra majestic today. Well, she got some nori. She's got a belly full of food. She's happy. Thank you. Insane Reefer finally said what I was trying to remember earlier, that people added to their own mix of fish food. They put Selcon in there. I told you I could remember what the bottle looked like, and I could, but could not read the label in my brain. So yeah, Selcon was a type of uh, vitamin mix that was added that was considered a really good choice to add into your batch of food when you made your own DIY fish food. Mr. Crackz says my leather coral is dying. I'm feeding Phyto and AB plus two days once. Okay, so leather corals are an easy coral. They're pretty hardy. So if it's quote unquote dying, that may just be that it's shut down, it's leaning over, it's shedding. That's what they do. But then they perk up again. For now, probably your best bet is to look at your system and see if there's anything specifically going on that's affecting the leather does the tank have the right amount of light is it and when i say the right amount you don't want to be too intense you definitely don't want to be too weak and you don't want to run it too long so if you are running your lights 12 hours a day that's too much for that leather if you could bring it down to maybe seven hours a day eight hours a day, you might see some improvement. You may need to run carbon in the water to take out some toxins out of the water, which that leather puts toxins in the water. So doing that would be helpful. A nice big water change, 25%, 50% could make a difference on the tank as well. So there's a lot of different things that could be considered, but we don't actually know what is wrong with the leather other than you said you think it's dying. It might just be shut down. It could be a fish is nipping at it. It could be leaning over, it could be shedding. So I'd need to know more details. Feel free to post that in Club Milo's Reef so we can check it out. Maybe we can help you. Man, I keep hearing my return pump turn on and off. It's so weird. Making me nervous. You can see all the bubbles coming out. Let's see. Steve says you need to be careful heating very small amounts of food in a microwave. The energy generated needs to be dissipated. It can damage the appliance. I heat everything in my microwave. <laughs> I, uh, thaw bagels i melt frozen meat i heat up a cup of coffee uh, i don't know i've had no surprises yet you know you would think if it was a brownout i'd have everything dimming it's literally all happening behind me so i'm going to have to look and make sure everything's okay um in the infusion it could be a fusion thing there was this one thing that happened once years ago, two, about two years ago, where the um, I was running the Apex Classic and there was some kind of update and it kept sending some kind of signal to reboot the Apex over and over and over. 
and my Apex rebooted like five times in a row in like 10 minutes. And I just went over and took out the ethernet cable and I'm kind of tempted to go do that right now just so it stops talking to the internet and see if that'll stop what's going on. But I have the newer version now and that was a bug that they they squashed, they fixed it. But it's reminding me of that day. So we'll have to see. Uh, GN Zake says, what kind of food raise nitrate more than phosphate? I'm struggling to raise nitrate and not phosphate. Well, you know, I talked about neophos. There's something called neonitro <laughs> and you can literally dose it. And earlier this, uh, in my, in my own tank, my nitrates tried to drop too fast at one point when I was in the middle of something. And I went ahead and I dosed neonitro for a few days and it just kept them from going any lower. And it worked out perfectly in my tank. And I haven't needed a dose since. I'm just still maintaining about 5 ppm week after week after week. But if you're not able to get the nitrates up, Neo Nitro is a solution. It's made by Brightwell, and I sell it on my website. Hey, Tim, I'm glad you enjoyed the videos. That was the point. I'm actually, I stuck all the uh, Maui Aquarium in iMovie today. I'll be working on that video so I can get it uploaded this weekend. I just need to, you know, kind of trim it down and do the narration, and that'll upload so you guys will get to see that here next. I didn't get any time to do it this week. I've been just watching a lot of TV. <gasps> TV! Okay, guys, if you have Netflix, you have to go see right now. As soon as you end this live stream, go put on Puff. It's a brand new video that just came out. It's about an hour long. It's about this puffer on the reef in Australia, and it's adorable. It's a tiny little guy, and they did such a nice video. Uh, it was a great, great um, footage was made. And during the final credits, the very, you know, the words, you get to see a little bit of behind the scenes of how they made the movie, which is kind of cool. I kind of wish they'd show more, but the, the footage, the macro videography was incredible. So check out Puff on Netflix if you're not a subscriber. Go get it. <laughs> go subscribe. Tell them I told you to go. Uh, it was really good. I watched it last night and I enjoyed every minute of it. Christian Coral says, can you help why my zoanthid uh, polyps are losing their color? Can you tell me why? It could just be a matter of not enough nutrients in the system. It could be your tank is too young. Um, it could be some water parameter is way off from where it should be. On my website, there is an article that's called Maintaining Good Water Quality. And you can just go to Google and type in Water Quality Mila's Reef, and it'll take you straight to the article. And you should read that over and start testing your water and see if you can figure out what's going on. Again, it could be it could be so many things. It's so hard to answer your question like that. But water quality is always number one. Lighting is number two. And then the third thing could be something kind of interaction with something else, you know, like two corals fighting and something stinging the heck out of your zoanthids. And usually zoanthids are pretty tough, but if something tougher is beating them up, they could look pale, they could look faded, they could be starving, not getting enough food, they could be struggling because the salinity isn't right. You need to really find out what's going on in your tank to be able to answer your question. Ariel says, can you target feed phytoplankton? I don't know. I mean, you can squirt anything at anything. <laughs> but getting that food to go directly at like a gargonian or to go directly at a feather duster might be a little challenging since it's a liquid. And as soon as you put it in the tank, you know, that cloud is there, but it's going to dissipate. It's, it's going to move. So it's more of a broadcast feed as far as I'm aware. I don't know anyone that I mean, like I said, if someone had an NPS tank and they had all these specific corals that need Fido, they may stop the flow and they may take a turkey baster in a bottle and go score to this coral, score to this coral, score to that coral, and go ahead and give everyone a meal. And uh, But then at some point, you got to turn the flow back on. It all goes everywhere anyway. So I don't know that target feeding is the way to go. By the way, back to the movie Puff. 
I learned something new last night. So at one point during the movie, they show a field of walking dendros. And, and they called them walking dendros. Like, oh, I love this movie. It's so good. And I knew, I've always known there's a worm inside the bottom of the walking dendro. And that's how the dendro walks across the sand bed. I never knew what the worm was. I never even thought to wonder what the worm was. And as the, in the video, they show the walking dendro has flipped over and there's the hole. And as the worm is coming out that I've never seen in real life, I was looking at it and said, that looks like a peanut worm. And then the uh, narrator said, the peanut worm lives inside. I was like, oh my God, I had no idea peanut worms lived in walking dendros. I came across a peanut worm in my own aquarium a long time ago. And I was fascinated. And I remember I was asking people, what the heck is this weird thing? It's like, it's like a sock that turns itself inside out as it reaches out and then it retracts within itself. It's like a snout. It's so weird. And, you know, people said, that's a peanut worm. And then one day, I think when I was breaking down my 29 gallon and moving the livestock into the 280, the whole peanut worm, the body and the tube was fully exposed. And that's where I got all those pictures that are on my critter ID on my website. And in my blog, I show all these photographs of what one looks like from every angle. And I just knew they lived in the rocks. You know, they'd put their, their meaty section down in the rock. The worm comes out and looks for food and then retracts. That's what they do. I didn't know they lived in the walking dendros. And that was such a cool thing to learn. <laughs> and I was just like, never even occurred to me that's what could be inside that creature. So that was really neat. Alex says, is it hard for fish to, is food hard to come by for fish in the wild? Um, well, it depends what you're talking about, what kind of fish and where they're at. If there's a healthy reef, there's plenty of food for everyone. If, and you know what, everything eats everything too. So, I mean, there's predators and then there's prey and there's everything in between that, right? But uh, if there's a dying reef, there's a lot less food present. Uh, a lot of times, once the uh, reef dies, algae takes over and chokes out any life of new reef reappearing. And the fish don't usually like to hang out in the algae beds necessarily. They prefer to be in the healthy coral reef. And so their food choices, again, everything gets affected in some form or fashion. But there are going to be areas where there's plenty of food and there's going to be areas where there's not so much. And that's why fish are always on the move. They're always foraging to find food and they do it all day long. And when we see tangs swimming all over the place in Hawaii, they are literally looking for food all day long. They're not just looking for that 11 o'clock meal that I provide. They are always looking for something to snack on. And there are a bunch of them swimming in a group, schooling and shoaling to find food. And when one, and like in the video I showed um, from my dive in Maui, there was a green sea turtle that was hovering in the water and there was some tangs picking at its neck. They were eating the algae off of its skin. So wherever there's, you know, a source of food, the tangs, the other fish will be looking for it. Skinner says, when I make my own food, I blend it with beta-glucan and focus, and I add everything, sea veggies and meats, and mash it up and freeze it, and they love it. it makes sense. Uh, Michael says, I'm a truck driver, and I'm out of town for four weeks at a time, and my girlfriend kind of keeps up with my tank. What is the best way to do this? Well, um, you can definitely use FaceTime or Skype or however it is you're communicating with video to kind of check on things. She has to care about the tank as, as much as you do for it to go well. Um, it's, it's, you know, you don't want to ask her to do things that are very difficult, but she'll never want to do it again. You'll just chase her away. So we don't want to do that. But so you're going to have to do the, hard, the heavy lifting when you get back home. But for the day to day, there are certain things that she should be doing. Feeding the tank is one. Checking that the protein skimmer has got the collection cup emptied out is another. Making sure the top off is happening regularly so that the water level doesn't drop in the sump and cause the salinity to rise in the tank. Um, water testing. If she can do the tests and tell you the results, that's great. If she can take a water sample to a local fish store and they do the test and then she read the results to you, that's another method. Having webcams, you can look at your tank from your phone or your iPad or whatever it is you use your devices would be another way to kind of keep an eye on things. But that's a tricky one. Being gone four weeks is a long time. 
I've never done that myself. Jason says, will high nitrates cause turf algae? No. Um, my zoas are not opening up. Will the nitrates cause the zoas to close up? I'm going to say no to that because my tank had nitrates of 80 and I had open zoanthids. So I don't think high nitrate will close them down. Zoanthids are a dirty coral. They like dirty water. They like phosphate. They like nitrate. That's not going to affect it. If the salinity gets too high, like 1.028, they may close up. But... Um, other than that, they just kind of need some good flow to keep them clean. And from time to time, you might take a turkey baster or a powerhead and blow the zoanthids off so that all that area between the polyps is clean and there's not like sponge growing in there and slime building up in there. You want them to be healthy, clean polyps. So you want to do that. They can benefit from some direct feeding, whether it's the smallest of pellet food or using Bena Reef as a... As a uh, broadcast food in the tank that can help um, a little bit of iodine in the tank is good for zoanthids again don't overdose it because it will make your fish gasp so we want to follow the exact instructions on the bottle and you do want to test somehow now i don't really like most of the iodine test kits so if everything's going well maybe do an icp test and find out what well is and if things are going badly Maybe do an ICP test to find out how low your number is so you know how much you need to bring it up. But uh, back to the turf algae. Nitrate doesn't invent turf algae. Turf algae grows from nitrogen and phosphate and light <laughs> and a lack of a cleanup crew. So we want to be in, we want to stay on top of things and make sure that our water quality is in a decent range in a reasonable area with a lot of mouths that are snacking on the algae as it's trying to grow. Uh, I've mentioned Eric Borneman a couple of times in this live stream today. One of his talks, you know, a decade ago or longer, he talked about, he actually said his, his name of his talk was have more cows or something along those lines. And he was saying, when you are driving past a field full of cows, the grass is all short out there. And that's because the cows are constantly chewing and mowing it down. And he said, most hobbyists don't have enough cows in their reef. And I always thought that was kind of a cool uh, analogy. So I have recommended for a long time to have more cleanup crew in your tank than what most of you are probably comfortable buying. Um, I don't know what size tank you have. I don't know how bad the algae infestation is. But generally speaking, if I told you I could fix your problem for $300, would it be worth it to you? And you're like, oh, yeah, I'll pay 300 bucks to get rid of this horrible algae. Like, okay, go buy a cleanup crew. <laughs> Just get some creatures in there that can eat the algae and get it under control. And of course, you are part of the cleanup crew too. So you got to get your arm wet and you got to reach in there and rip off as much as you can manually yourself. And so my target, my, my, uh, my attack of this, my approach to resolve an algae problem in a tank is lower the phosphates first and rip out as much algae as I can and then add a cleanup crew. And if you do those three things, you'll usually get everything under control and you'll be very happy with your tank. All right. I am going to stop here. I'm tired and my head hurts and I think I'm going to have to do an ice pack. But um, thank you so much for tuning in today. Today is Water Test Saturday. We've been talking about water quality a little bit, but not much. So we want to check everything. Alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, nitrate, salinity, temperature, pH, potassium, maybe iodine. <laughs> and we want to know what these numbers are. We, we need to know the values. So if something is lacking, we can correct it. If there's too much of something, we can correct it. We want to make sure everything is working correctly because we're heading into a holiday and you don't want to be fighting your tank during Christmas. Next weekend, there's no live stream. So, um, you know, you'll get what you get when you get it. But for now, I just want to wish you guys a Merry Christmas. I hope that you have a good holiday with your family. 